our, uh, our consumer business. Uh, and that's about treating disease, of course, but preventing it and really trying to do that at serious scale. So relative to our size, our impact in terms of the volume of people we're reaching around the world is huge. So we want to reach two and a half billion people uh, over the decade ahead. And we do that by being, first of all, a world leader in vaccines. And there's so much exciting uh, technology, particularly for adult vaccination coming through, through everything that we've learned, of course, uh, uh, through the pandemic. But we were very excited to be uh, bringing the world's first RSV vaccine uh, to market uh, just this last quarter. And that started really well with lots of headroom to, for growth and some really exciting pipeline coming through uh, beyond that in adult vaccination. Um, but also, um, it's not as simple uh, as vaccines. When we look across our other therapy areas, like uh, HIV, for example, where we were the first to move into long acting, uh, probably five years ahead uh, of our competitors, and where we're seeing that as being a real driver of growth, and frankly, uh, the upgrades to our outlooks, both in tr treatment through long acting uh, drugs, which prevents further transmission of HIV, which is fundamentally important, but also actually uh, in injectables that do prevent HIV infection in the first place. Um, and, and then we, if we look at uh, respiratory, which is another field where we uh, have a huge portfolio. And in fact, just a few hours ago, we we're updating the market on some really uh, sizable assets where we've got a lot of data coming through just in the next couple of years in respiratory. We're also looking at longer acting treatments where, for example, in uh, severe asthma, we may have, um, we'll have some data through next year for an asset that could require just two injections uh, uh, a year, uh, which is a fantastic when you think about preventing the kind of attacks that require hospitalization. The US alone spends $9 billion a year on vaccines, preventable diseases, the treatment of them in hospital. And, uh, you know, we see, so many uh, exciting new uh, technologies and opportunities coming through in vaccines. I think 80% of the world's vaccines pipeline is for uh, adult vaccinations and half of it is for diseases that don't have prevention solutions yet. And, you know, I could go on, but uh, we probably should get to the next uh, question. If you think about earlier intervention in oncology as well, I mean, there are lots of ways which uh, stopping disease in its tracks before it starts or intervening earlier to uh, slow progression or complications is incredibly uh, important. And we're very, very committed to that. Sure. Um, I did want to pick up on what you said about um, adult vaccination, right? Because I think sort of at a societal level, we think about prevention and vaccination is like routine childhood immunization. So yeah. I'm just, uh, you know, interested in, in your thinking around, okay, adults, um, you know, age 50 or over 60, perhaps there are other age groups you're looking at. You know, how, is that not well understood in your view? Well, well, you put the question uh, exactly right. I think probably pre-COVID, most of us when we're thinking about vaccines is those routine immunizations you had to get, you know, from, with a new baby or pediatrician or to get kids into school. Uh, and, you know, one of the most important and pioneering launches we had at GSK was our shingles vaccine, which is, you know, going to be a, it's already more than two and a half billion so far this year in pounds. It'll be more than four billion by, by our, our outlook for 2026. One in three of us get shingles and we have a vaccine with over 90 percent efficacy um, uh, and with uh, protection for at least 10 years. Really thrilled just very recently to announce a deal uh, for distribution of, of, of shingle, shingrix in China, um, which will deliver you know, uh, a huge expansion of our reach. Uh, for that market, where in fact our clinical trials showed efficacy of more than 100% on this very painful, debilitating uh, disease. Um, the, the, if you just get back to the fundamentals of demographics, um, the reality is that the over 60 population is going to increase by 30% by 2030. And the comorbidities that people uh, are often suffering from at huge scale um, and we see that particularly in Western markets like your home country and mine, um, you know, adds meaningfully to the complications that could come from this. This is really what's happened for us with our RSV adult vaccine. Great contrast. Um, there are excitingly some new pediatric solutions in RSV, but that birth cohort uh, every year is, I think, just over a million. Uh, in America, you've got over 80 million 
uh, over 60s. And by the way, we're looking in RSV, our older adult vaccine. We now have data for the 50s to 59s. At the moment, it's approved for over 60s. That's another 40 million Americans. And you know, when you the, the reason that cohort is, is so important is it's those with comorbidities, i.e., they've got other diseases going on at the same time, as you as you know, they represent 95% of the hospitalizations, and there are 170,000 of them every single year for RSV in the US alone. And on that cohort, we have 95% efficacy, or 94, I think, to be technically correct. But uh, uh, so, so, you know, these are people who can get very sickly and sick and tragically, I think there are 15,000 deaths every year in the US. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a huge population. It's a growing one. It's a significant burden of disease. And now, of course, we've opened up these new channels of a vaccination in pharmacies where it's much more convenient. There are registered databases. And uh, this is really a good way to reduce the burden of disease, to take the pressure off healthcare systems that are overcrowded and often don't have enough staff. And, uh, you know, it's really exciting innovation to come. I'm glad you mentioned pharmacies um, uh, because apropos of your RSV vaccine, right? The US launch has just taken off, right? Um, for many people, it's gone better than expected, right? In terms of... Uh, in terms of penetration and even, you know, uh, and, and revenue. How, how did you get such a good deal with CVS, you know, the big pharmacy chain? Uh, it seems that there is a, a preferential access through those pharmacies. Well, well, let's start. Let's start with the facts, uh, which is always the first question that, that is asked rightly, which is what does the data show and does your vaccine work and how is how complete is the data package and and as i said you know i think we're delighted with the start of the rx rsv vaccine will be more than a billion pounds in its first uh in its first year and has lots of headroom uh, for growth because we only have i think three million of that over 80 million over 60s vaccinated so far um but we start with a good asset, which shows 94% efficacy on those that represent 95% uh, of, uh, of the hospitalizations. And, and interestingly, this vaccine initially, it's a, approval along with uh, others. And by the way, it's good that there's more than one because that creates a market. And we like that um, because it's, you know, I'd rather have a, a, a market share of a huge market than 100% of a smaller one. And I think it creates awareness and, and that's a really good thing. Um, we have a data package that shows uh, this. We are going. We have um, uh, uh, co-administration, which means you can get both a flu vaccine and an RS vac RSV vaccine at the same time, and the efficacy of both is, you know, uncompromised. Um, we have data already uh, that shows that this gives protection for a, a couple of years. That's important because one of the questions we will have to look at over time is whether you can not very English, but de-seasonalize the vaccination, even if the disease is, is um, uh, quite seasonal or very seasonal. Um, uh, but we also have you know, a portfolio of vaccines uh, and the R in RSV stands for respiratory. And we have a very large um, uh, respiratory field force because uh, of our other solutions in asthma and COPD. So we're able to build awareness through the primary care channel because this is at this stage, the approvals for these vaccines still need the recommendation of either uh, uh, a general practitioner or a pharmacist. So, in that sense, all of those things uh, uh, help. But um, you know, uh, it's good that there's more than one solution. We're delighted with our progress. It's early days, and we're really looking forward to submitting this data on the 50 to 59 year old cohort as well. Yeah, what's the timeline for that? We should submit at the end of uh, by the end of this year. So hopefully, let's see, we'll get it in for the season for next year. Okay. Um, now, when you think globally, right, this RSV vaccine would have lots of value outside of the US, EU, Japan. Yeah. Um, what is the thinking for GSK about getting it, making it available more broadly around the world? Well, um, obviously, as soon as we can, and we were very thoughtful um, around preparing supply to allow globalization. Um, it's always worth starting first in the US, not only because it is the largest market, but it's also one, you know, remains, whatever the, in, you know, various environmental pressures, um, uh, it remains by far the 
fastest country to launch innovation at scale in. Um, so we start there, but and maybe in contrast to some of our earlier vaccines launches, we've really we're really being very uh, aggressive as much as we can around globalization, certainly in the more mature markets first. Uh, and I say that um, it's interesting because we talked a lot about prevention at the beginning. Regulators for all, you know, are really starting to recognize the value of prevention for their healthcare sit for, for their healthcare system. So, you know, I'm sure you will come on to ask me about the IRA perhaps at one point, but that's one of the very positive things is that co-pays removed for vaccines because the return on vaccination is like at least 300%. It's the most efficient healthcare intervention apart from clean water. Uh, and we've seen the approval, at least in the private markets in other countries, so Germany or the UK, UK approval on our Shingrix vaccine was quite a few years after the US. It has already been approved in the UK here. Uh, uh, for the private private market. The next phase after that is to get into national immunization programs. And then, of course, because we are a company that has a strong reputation for global access, we're being really thoughtful about how, over time, we're able to open that up to uh, other you know, lower or mid-income countries uh, uh, too. So, yeah, this is a, a vaccine that's just started. I mean, I think it's 50 years the industry has been exploring the possibility of an RSV vaccine. We're absolutely thrilled to have been first, um, but we're only at the beginnings of this journey. And, you know, there are, uh, we focus a lot and everyone looks at how US launches go first, but uh, it is a fraction of the global uh, population that can benefit from this vaccine. Yeah, um, I, I do. I, I wanted to push on it a little bit. So are you thinking, is this still a prospect of years away to bring this into other, um, you know, developing markets? Or is it, you know, a, a decade away? I, I, no, I wouldn't put it. It's not, it's not a decade away. I mean, the first, again, the tiering of it is we we are not supply constrained. That yeah. what, 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 it, what constrains you is, first of all, regulation and approvals. And you do want to make sure that you are able to go into, into for, for all mature markets, you go into a global pricing band, rightly. But just as we do on our other vaccines, we have tiered pricing for other geographies. Now, remember, this is an older adult vaccine. So I'll give you a simple example of, you have to look at where the burden of disease is in some countries. Across Africa, the demand for an older over 60s vaccine is less likely to be as dominant. Uh, as for some of our pediatric vaccines or the opening up of our patents that we do for, uh, for, for HIV. So what there is zero debate about is our commitment here. You know, we are probably the biggest single provider to Gavi. We have policies of uh, uh, tiered, um, tiered pricing and, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, we just have to make sure we understand where the burden of disease sits. Sure. Um... You know, I'm going to bring in an audience question here. It's it's a question that has sort of COVID-19 uh, front of mind is within the pharmaceutical industry, right? Is there a conversation now about sharing data on research when it comes to vaccines for future pandemics, right? Should we come into this situation again, I guess, right? With a new pathogen. Yeah. Um, what What is there? What is that conversation like within the industry to the extent that it's there? Well, I think people... Um perhaps don't uh, recognize enough how significant the collaboration was uh, amongst the industry uh, from day one. I mean, uh, it, there was an enormous amount of mobilization, uh, shared mobilization to try and come up uh, with solutions together, uh, uh, with insight on the science, with you think about it, an approach initially around the industry bringing on a full range of possible technology solutions uh, to bring to bear. And in fact, we talk about collaboration, um, you know, and we were delighted for the world that mRNA vaccines came out as a solution and mobilized behind that in our own portfolio of next gen mRNA uh, vaccines in the future. But initially with COVID, um, we offered our adjuvant to a whole variety of partners to be able to come up with a solution uh, at pace. So there was always a lot of collaboration, first of all. Um, and secondly, there is there continues to be significant reflection 
uh, on uh, you know how we continue to do better next time. Uh, and I think you know there's a but and that's by the way not just within the industry but part of between the industry regulators and uh, and governments too. Sure. Um, so across the pharma industry right now, the big buzz is around weight loss drugs. Uh, cool. And and I'm you know curious is GSK looking at that space at all? Uh, and if you're not, is it is it hard to get heard uh, about other products right now? Well, first of all, you know it's fantastic. Obesity is a huge burden uh, of disease um, and uh, massive healthcare challenge, and it's really good to see treatments coming through. That, that can operate at such scale. And by the way, bring us back to the prevention agenda because fundamentally the benefit, it, it is in its own right, a significant uh, burden uh, of disease, but more importantly, the, the knock-on effect on other comorbidities uh, we know uh, is um, is very serious. So, um, you know, I think that's that's great. The, the reason this has had such a strong reaction and I'm, you know, uh, aside from the, the potential, is, is that the core is the scale of the impact this can have. And so I think the way that we like to think about it is, you know, there was a period some time ago when it, people were a bit less focused, it's a horrible word, but on the notions of blockbusters. The reality is what pharma, biopharma companies should be doing is, is working really hard to have breakthrough benefits in diseases of material scale uh, around the world. Um, uh, and so that's really what we like to think about. And, you know, as I said, uh, we have a whole array of, frankly, multi-billion potential assets in vaccination, which can reach hundreds of millions of people uh, because of the scale of those. So Shingrix we've talked about, you know, we're expecting in the next few years to be at 4 billion. RSV can be of this kind of scale. We're pursuing mRNA next gen uh, vaccines for uh, uh, multivalent flu, maybe a combo uh, uh, with other uh, respiratory viruses. We have a brand new platform technology uh, for pneumococcal disease, which could be a you know, four billion uh, asset if that works through to come through uh, at the end of the decade. In HIV, we see multi-billion potential in long-acting treatments and and uh, prevention. That over towards the end of the decade, we could clearly got line of sight in three injections a year. It could get to two uh, injections a year. Just this morning, uh, we were talking to the market about three assets in respiratory, which could be more than six billion. Uh, uh, in sales, hepatitis B, a huge burden of disease, 500 million people uh, living with that, um, uh, uh, sorry, 300, 300 million people and, and, and uh, nearly a million deaths every single year. Uh, we're looking at a therapeutic um, from Hep B and we may have a functional cure there. Um, and we just did a great deal with the J&J assets to see if we can increase the reach of that. Uh, a therapeutic vaccine maybe for herpes uh, uh, simplex. And, and then of course, I haven't even touched on oncology uh, where we've just had some new encouraging data through, but also some great approvals uh, for some new assets there. So what we're focused on, uh, delighted that the obesity drugs have come through, we're focused on bringing to market competitive differentiated assets of scale and, and, and you know making uh, them successful. And so, so with that, right, as you've described these big growth areas, right, how do you understand, um, you know, where basically where Wall Street is when they look at GSK, right? Is it is it disappointing to you to see that they aren't as focused as squarely on the RSV launch or sort of the potential growth areas, right? We're, we're talking about, you know, in terms of the share price, yeah. um, it seems like it's, it's down about 16% since you took over the helm. Um, and I guess last calculations, maybe about 19% since the Halion unit was spin off, spun off, right? Well, how do you explain that? Well, I mean, first of all, I think, you know, when you look at the trajectory of the share price, we took a, a particularly uh, striking hit through the case of Zantac uh, in August of last year. Sure. Um, uh, and that, you know, definitely had an impact and, and is a clear overhang uh, on the stock. We're very confident of our position there and working our way uh, through it. You've seen us. Um, I mean, there are 15 independent studies that are pretty unequivocal on the science. Uh, we have to work it through and we keep everyone updated uh, on our progress. We have an important case uh, coming up in Q1 next year. 
Uh, but we're undistracted by that and really most focus on the performance of the business. But clearly that's um, uh, something of an overhang that we have to work through. Other than that, I mean, we are in our second year of significant switch in operating performance. Um, and I was delighted just at the last quarter, you know, to upgrade again uh, our outlook for double digit growth. We're extremely confident uh, about that five year outlook to 26 of uh, more than 5% top line growth, double digit operating profit growth. Uh, and we continue to make great progress on, uh, on the pipeline, which means, you know, we're in better shape now than we were in mid 21. Um, uh, when we gave that outlook uh, for 2031. Uh, and, I, you know, we're really looking forward to continuing to keep the market updated on our progress of what they're most focused on, which is delivering on the strategy where we've had a lot of support, but also focusing on what's coming next in terms of uh, profitable, competitive growth. And we're making good progress, but, you know, that's what I try and focus on most of all. Sure. Um, and, and how is the conversation these days with, with Elliot? one of your investors. More well, you're, uh, <laughs> you're not, Michelle, going to get me to comment on any single uh, or individual investor. You know, as I said, I uh, we talk a lot to our investors and uh, what they're all focused on is us delivering on the strategy that we've lay, laid out and, and staying focused on profitable growth, the innovation that's coming through. And that's really uh, what we're doing and uh, keeping people up. Uh, everywhere updated uh, on how we're doing. Okay. Um, to get back to a moment to the Zantac uh, case, right? Yeah. And the, the, you know, there have been some settlements that have already begun to come in. Um, by some estimates, uh, putting that litigation to rest might cost about $5 billion. Is that a reasonable assessment in your view? Well, first of all, we're extremely confident in our position. And as you know, uh, vigorously defending it. Uh, we've had some absolutely kind of minimal settlements, I suppose you would say, or nominal set settlements, where we've taken a pragmatic view to avoid distraction, uh, frankly, um, uh, as we work this through, continue to, to defend our position. And I'm not going to comment on our legal strategy further than that for obvious reasons. Um, I think the key thing is we're not changing our capital allocation, uh, our investment. We continue to pursue BD. We continue to invest in R&D and we continue to keep the organization uh, completely undistracted, but obviously the markets are updated uh, as we progress this. So um, one area that we are looking across, across industries um, is the issue of companies and, and the question of whether and how much to de-risk from China. Mm. Uh, and as you mentioned, right, GSK has just entered into this very significant distribution deal for the single shingles vaccine in, in yeah. China. Um, how do you think about geopolitical risk uh, and the and the market in China more broadly? Well, first of all, um, it's a very significant market, um, which is increasingly open to innovation. GSK has... I suppose you would say, considering the geopolitical context, a relatively low level of, of exposure. And, uh, and and we see it as a very clear opportunity uh, for real growth. Um, partnered well, invested in assets that matter for China. Uh, and that's why we're so excited by um but the Jufei deal, which is focused on Shingrix, but where we have an option for RSV uh, for later, um, but also looking at our pipeline in really relevant products, uh, innovative uh, and relevant pro products, and I referred to HEP B earlier as well, and, and there will be others uh, that come through. I think, so we definitely see it as, a, as an exciting uh, opportunity for growth. Uh, and of course, the scale um, uh, of reach there if you're set up i mean if the example of shingrix we have a really material acceleration of just the points of vaccination that we can work through which if they who have a track record of taking uh, you know other international uh, vaccines responsibly um uh, and successfully uh, to market there i think the other way i think about china is of course in terms of supply chain in fact two other ways supply chain where um and it's not just a China geopolitical risks. I think in general, as we all learned through COVID and because healthcare is a 
strategically important uh, industry for pretty much every country, um, having a de-risk supply chain with dual sourcing, uh, particularly on APIs, is very important. We don't have factories in China, but we do source APIs there and, and with extremely professional, high-quality companies, and they are often part of our dual sourcing uh, strategy and will continue to be. And then I suppose the uh, the last thing that I would say, and you've seen us doing more of this recently, um, is, you know, it is a it can be a great market to pursue BD deals and access innovation because it's a country that has structurally invested in, in um, domestic capability. So we just announced recently a, a deal, the all fashionable ADCs uh, with Hanso uh, continuing to sort of, I mean, it's early stage stuff, but um, to build out our women's cancer, so for ovarian and, and uh, endometrial, maybe beyond that, uh, uh, ADCs. So uh, we still think it's important. Um, we would, you know, we we want to see growth uh, and, you know, we're pleased to uh, see the kind of progress that, that we're making. But obviously, like everybody, we're very thoughtful uh, about managing exposures. Mm -hmm. um, okay. All right, I'm going to bring in another audience question here. Um, so, you, uh, so your work with uh, NGOs uh, in low-income countries is very exciting. How important do you think your role is in achieving health equity globally, and how important are these NGO partnerships and localization in this work? It's really important. Yeah, um, and you know. Look, when we talk about the purpose of GSK, uh, we, we do our work, of course, for shareholders, of course, for patients, and also for our people. <laughs> and part of the, at GSK, we believe strongly that part of our license to operate is to provide responsible access. That has to be done in a sustainable way. So you're always looking to find the balance between resourcing uh, high risk innovation, which is what we do fundamentally in terms of the allocation of capital uh, in uh, uh, R&D, pricing it responsibly for um, uh, to, to generate sufficient returns to keep funding it, but also organizing ourselves in terms of access um, to uh, reach people at the kind of scale that we need to. And, you know, I think we're, we are, we've got loads of progress to make. Um, we're definitely an undervalued uh, uh, company, but one of the things we are extremely well known for is our leadership in access. We've topped the access to medicine index, I think eight times in a row. If you look at our HIV business, very simply, we're not the biggest HIV co company, but we, um, of the 28 million people in the world who are on antiretrovirals, 23 million of those are on GSK V to HIV portfolio, and 21 of those 23 uh, are pretty much entirely across Africa and low-income countries where we've opened up our patents whilst still being able to be successful and profitable in the Western markets. I talked earlier about our contribution to Gavi um, in a whole variety of uh, different uh, vaccines where we tier pricing really aggressively for lower and middle uh, income uh, countries. For all of our launches, we consider how and where globalization should be most relevant wherever we can. Um, and uh, I mean, very importantly, we are one of the few companies who invests really materially in our R&D and innovation uh, for diseases that have phenomenally high burden in the developing world. I mean, we committed to spend over the decade ahead a billion, over a decade, um, uh, in uh, you know across that portfolio of diseases like malaria, TB. It's also our HIV work as well. I mean, you know, malaria for every parent on the call to take a deep breath on. You know, the number of under fives who are killed by um, or die from malaria across Africa is terrifying. And we were absolutely delighted that we were able to bring, you know, the world's first WHO approved vaccine, which has just gone beyond its um, uh, initial 
pilot countries, I think it's just been launched in Cameroon and there are a few more countries about to come through as well. It's still progress to make on getting to higher efficacy, but it's, you know, that, so all of that work matters. What we've really learned how to do is at the same time, because it matters to the NGOs we partner with, it matters to our people, it matters to our scientists to have scale impact, but at the same time, we need to deliver the kind of sustainable, competitive, profitable returns to shareholders uh, that we're so invested doing in doing. And you know, that's part of the balancing act of this of this industry, but it's part of the license to operate, not just in the developing world, but just as strongly across the inequities in the developed markets like the US. I mean, there's been such a strong light shone on that and you know give the example of adult vaccination and then i'll stop but um you know we all saw the social inequities through covid um uh whether that's um you know basic social de demographics uh, ethnic demographics in terms of access and you know it's it's one of the things that we need to do a a lot more work on in uh, in many countries around the world to make sure uh that you know, access to healthcare uh, is as equitable as possible. Yeah, um, there are m m many issues right exposed through our, the experience with COVID. Um, yeah. I am curious with the malaria vaccine, how is how is the funding shaping up for that to make that available more widely? Well, it's ongoing. They've just expanded it to a few more countries beyond beyond the pilots. We, you know, can can as always in this, and this is where what we've learned is we need to do this in partnership not just uh for the payment of the vaccines but frankly even more importantly for the distribution of of them uh particularly in countries where the distribution systems the healthcare systems can be a bit more a bit more fragile so the dialogue continues there is another vaccine that's also coming through uh as well so you know i'm hopeful we'll be able to get to more scale of reach uh you know in the years ahead yeah, well, was that surprising to you to see the WHO recommend this this second vaccine right, oh, developed cool. by Oxford? I mean, and and they were pretty clear. You know, by the way, these are not these are important responsibilities for us. And by the way, the innovation is an important point that came through on the malaria uh, vaccine. The adjuvant that is in the malaria vaccine is the one we use in uh, in Shingrix and in RSV. So don't underestimate the returns that that can come in 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 that sense indirectly. From the science that we explore here um uh but but look we've got the first vaccine until you have one that's you know got guaranteed efficacy at super high levels it's brilliant that new innovation comes through i think if they're looked on a like for like basis in terms of the trials that were done they're reasonably comparable but i think it's fantastic fantastic uh, that you have uh, more solutions coming through and by the way, we just did some very early work. I think that we published with uh, John Hopkins on a whole new bacteria of discovered of science that may be able to have another scientific route to addressing this disease that's been around since you know biblical times. Um, uh, and uh, we continue to you know be pretty tireless on that. But it is a part of the work we do, um, and it is only funded when we are able to bring successful scale uh, innovative solutions in meaningful demand in uh, uh, the richer markets. And so we always have to make sure we're balancing those two things uh, together. And I'm really pleased about the progress we're making more broadly in R&D. You know, we've increased our R&D spend by over 40 percent in the last five years. Um, spending money isn't an end in its own right, but we have been unequivocal that innovation is the first priority for the company. And that's what new GSK is all about. All about. Uh, and we just want to make sure we're doing that uh, not only for the richer countries uh, with the cutting edge innovation, but also so that we can reach these two and a half billion people over the decade ahead and, and really have a meaningful impact as a, as a company. So uh, in, in talking about future investments, uh, you are sitting uh, or have quite a bit of cash in reserve from the Halion spinoff. Yeah. What are, what are you looking at right now in terms of the use of the proceeds? Is this sort of a, an element of additional R&D, more bolt-on deals, or would you consider something more ambitious? Well, we're always ambitious. We try to be uh, as smart as we can with the allocation of capital. And uh, we've been clear that our number one priority is the pipeline and further innovation. Um, now, well over half of the industry's pipeline comes from BD. And it's going up um, 
And it was one of the biggest changes I think I, that I uh, put in place with Hal and then Tony is to kind of open up GSK's both appetite and capacity <laughs> with a complete reset of the balance sheet uh, and frankly, the operating performance, which is generating uh, uh, more cash now that we are a kind of pure, uh, purely focused and more focused uh, biopharma company. Um, we've done a lot of deals um, and really pleased. I mean, again, even just recently to see the approval of uh, Ajara. So in myelofibrosis, patients with anemia in myelofibrosis, by the way, on a broader label than we bought that uh, asset for. So it's now late, uh, line uh, uh, agnostic. Uh, just presenting this morning our excitement around Camelopixin for chronic refractory cough, a multi-billion uh, opportunity for a horrific disease that has no current solution. Pay, uh, you know, uh, doctor satisfaction for those with chronic refractory cough is 3%. And this is 28 million people around the world coughing up to, you know, sometimes 900 times a day. And for 10 million of them, they've been living that for more than a year. And we now have something uh, that hopefully we'll have the data through next uh, next next year on. You know, I refer to the deal we just did with the, for a J&J asset to combine with our HEP B uh, solution, the new ADC deal we've done. You know, we. We are delighted with the data that's just come through uh, for Jen Perley and endometrial cancer from a deal that we did with Tesaro. So, you know, and I referred much earlier to a really scale uh, asset that we brought through uh, for pneumococcal disease, um, which it could be a big new, completely differentiated, hopefully best in class vaccine at the end of the decade. So. We don't see this as adjacent to R&D. We think business development is part of how you do R&D. Um, we make it core to the objectives of our head of R&D, who brought a new talent to, to, to lead it from him. We put in new teams in the parts of the world uh, where the most exciting innovation is, is going on. And, and definitely it's the first priority uh, for capital allocation, both organic and inorganically. And very important, we, we, we assess any projects uh, across the full portfolio, um, uh, across the, uh, and it, with the same measures, uh, all to be looking to drive, you know, uh, increasingly competitive and profitable growth for, for you know, towards the end of the decade and, and beyond. So that's really where we're going to be focused. I think it would be right to say, uh, at kind of the pace and scale and focus of the kinds of things you've seen us do today. Okay. Um, so to bring you back into the United States, right, you you mentioned briefly the Inflation Reduction Act, yeah. um, sort of the, the, the biggest element of which for the pharma industry has been the introduction of negotiations, price negotiations in Medicare. GSK is not, you're, you're not first on the list uh, to be affected by it. Um, but as you watch this unfold, could you see the company joining uh, either litigation against the Medicare negotiations or in, a, in some other way lobbying against it? Um... Well, it's interesting what you were saying uh, earlier about how if you're, you know, uh, not with one of the multi-billion obesity drugs, you get less attention. There are advantages uh, to being having a spread of portfolio, um, uh, not just, by the way, the day that things come off patent so that you can manage that risk, um, but it also means we're not in the front line uh, here. We have factored in IRA uh, implications for us, um, which is related to the AMP cap for our Gen Meds business. And um, in 2025, we'll have some exposure in HIV, but all of that is not specific asset negotiations. All of that is factored into our outlooks and our upgraded outlooks uh, uh, um, uh, in the case of uh, HIV and uh, and keeping our gen meds, which is mainly business that are pattern uh, stable through the, the five-year outlook. So I think we are able to digest that. Uh, you know, as I said, there are some aspects of the IRA. If you just step back, it's we should be expecting uh, regulation in an environment that is unsustainable and accelerating, and and I think we I think most people would say it's a very good thing that patient out of pocket is capped and is made more predictable. It's a very good thing that people don't have to co-pay for vaccines. That is a lot better for the patient, but it's also and we saw an uplift uh, in uptake certainly when when that began. Um, 
quite loud at vaccines. It is so much cheaper to keep people out of hospitals. So it's really, if, if the goal is to reduce budgets, so it's a very, uh, as well as help patients, it's a very good way of doing it. I think there are two things that we are um, less comfortable with. Um, one of, because of the unintended consequences they are likely to have. One is uh, this distinction between small molecules and biologics, where it's just, there is absolutely no logic whatsoever to penalize one kind of scientific development versus another, when the only thing that matters is, can you get a differentiated outcome for patients? And arguably, by the way, look, back to your last question on um, access, small molecules are better for access because they can often be provided without, you know, hospitalization or, or, or clinic use. You can really provide them in community care. So there, if you want to drive access, the idea that we're penalizing small molecule science is, is an, we think, a, an unhelpful one. And then in terms of price setting provisions, I think we have to watch out for the unintended consequences here, which is not just about the direct negotiation on which assets get hit, but is what's going to happen to patient choice? What are the knock-on impacts going to be? Because, you know, uh, and, and therefore, then what happens in terms of, you know, pressures on, on uh, investment and innovation? And, th and the reason that matters is I think, you know, at its most basic level, the best thing our industry can do is solve the problems in the first place. There are still too many cancers that don't have solutions. Even the biggest medicines in the world don't work for 80% of lung cancer patients. We're starting to scratch the surface on neurodegeneration, but one in three of us, uh, you know, is going to be facing it. And I bet, you know, everybody on the call has been close to somebody who's dealing with that before you even get into the cost for economies for caring. So, I, you know, I, I think the US leads the world without doubt in innovation and uh, needs to watch on how protect, to protect for that. I'm gonna bring in another audience question right now. Uh, which areas do you think GSK could utilize technology better to drive innovation, efficiencies, cost savings, uh, and how will these feed into your 2024 priorities? And may I just add, maybe that's also a little bit of a segue into AI. Yeah. <laughs> Potentially. Well, I've, just, I've just come back in from the West Coast and I am, um, you know, I'm a huge optimist for technology and a massive advocate for it. And I think it's going to change everything. Um, and we deliberately put at the heart of the purpose of GSK that we combine science, tech, and talent. I do believe, by the way, also in human agency uh, and as deploying tech um, at our service. Uh, we think, uh, and we've been investing in it for some time. I think we have to all be careful to avoid the temptation of thinking doing good tech, good AI, and you know, is is our job. Our job is to invent. Uh, scale new meaningful medicines and vaccines. It's it's another way to do that better and faster, uh, but it is a completely phenomenal game-changing way. Uh, at GSK, we think of tech in two ways. We think of it in platform tech, and we think of it in data tech. Uh, you know, don't forget, technology is what we do, not just in our labs, but in our factories. And, uh, and we are really differentiated on our vaccines technology, um, uh, whether that be the adjuvants that we're using for best in class solutions of protein vaccines, emerging new platforms in mRNA, this new MAPS technology, and more and more thoughtfully about where that can all go in terms of therapeutic vaccines as well. Um, we're exploring more and more uh, oligonucleotides. That's where uh, Hep B is taking us, which is exciting. And and you know then you can get into the really expert technology of how you get to a world of these long acting uh, drugs, which are brilliant for compliance, for convenience, and for prevention of uh, you know both issues and progress. And you know eventually, in some cases, we work more and more towards remission. So in platform tech, we do a lot of work. Um, and we organize our teams. I mean, interestingly, you know, our, our head of R&D came from running our kind of platform and our, our technology pieces, because I think this is, you know, platforms and has in his turn um, appointed a single head of technology platforms across all uh, therapy areas, um, prevention and treatment, so we can start to scale this more productively. In data tech, 
you know, you're, it, it hits every part of the value chain, like in every company. Uh, it explicitly is part of how we will be leveraging, moving to a period of leverage in SGNA. You know, we've invested very heavily in increasing R&D, but also we've been investing behind uh, behind our launches. And as from 24, we're going to move into a period of leverage um, uh, for uh, uh, SGNA particularly. And part of that is using technology, like in every company, to be more efficient, whether that's in the way we market, the way we sell, the way we run our back offices, the way we allocate uh, investments with more agility. Um, obviously, we look at it for the productivity of our manufacturing. I mean, I can tell you one of the biggest drivers of our improvements in yields on Shingrix was all to do with our use of uh, AI. Uh, so, and you know, you can get into all sorts of work on basics of working capital management and the rest of it. So all of that are areas uh, that we keep behind the scenes. The most exciting thing which will change our industry, and I do believe that, I just don't think it's happening as soon as people would like it to, uh, or are saying it is, um, but it will change everything is solving for the challenge of productivity of R&D. And we do that, you know, we've invested in data partnerships at scale, in uh, AI and ML teams explicitly, whether it's in London or Boston or San Francisco or Tel Aviv. Um, and, you know, I think by the end of next year, we'll have 90% of our research using predictive and real-time modeling techniques to try and improve the probability of success of, of, of and the volume throughput of, of targets. But, you know, then you get into designing clinical trials and all the work that we can do to be more, I mean, one of the ways we got RSV to be accelerated by two years, because we were two years behind and then ended up being approved first is by being much more predictive in the where we put clinical trials and following diseases and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's everywhere, it's really exciting. Uh, but I love the question because the only thing that matters is show me which medicines it's made bigger and faster. So believe it or not, we're actually we've just run a little bit over. Uh, clearly, that, <laughs> there was a good it was a good question. It was a meaty uh, question. But uh, I want to thank you, uh, Emma Walmsley, right. for joining us today. Uh, and I want to thank our audience as well. A very, very uh, detailed and informative discussion. Well, so wonderful you. to see you. And thank you, everybody who's taken the time to join us. Thanks, Michelle. See you soon. Okay, bye-bye.